Good afternoon, welcome to Senate Education. This Thursday, April 13th, uh, we <clears throat> just got off the floor. We're gonna, we've made some shifts. We're gonna start with serve, learn, and earn for about 10 minutes. This is, we're working on our letter to appropriations committee, to the appropriations committee. And so uh, the appropriations committee has asked us to uh, consider this request. And so with that, uh, Mr. Knopf, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. For the record, I'm Breck Knopf, uh, the executive director of Vermont Youth Conservation Corps. I will try to be brief. Um, I'm gonna bounce through different parts of prepared remarks, and so forgive me if it's a little, the flow isn't 100%, and it's a little disjointed, but I think we can, um, can get there. Um, I think it's important to recognize, to share that Serve, Learn, Earn is a workforce development and teaching coalition between four organizations, Vermont Youth Conservation Corps, Audubon Vermont, Vermont Works for Women, and Resource. Um, it's helpful to think about Serve, Learn, Earn as filling a gap. Um, so we offer uh, education, ser paid service experiences for young adults, really between the ages of 16 and 24. That's BYCC's sweet spot. Other partners uh, have other participants who are both younger and older. Um, uh, next slide. Um, some top line numbers to illustrate and quantify our impact. Um, this year, we expect that we'll have approximately 400 participants who are coming into our programs. Next year, with increased funding, we anticipate that we'll be able to enroll 500. Um, in each of our programs, we have more applications than we actually have positions. So at BYCC, we've received 340 applications for 190, uh, 190 positions. Um, I talked about a gap. Uh, in that we're focused on the 16 to 24 year old demographics. A couple statistics before um, sharing a couple education initiatives at BYCC that are relevant here. We have the highest high school graduation rate in the country, 91%, uh, and we have one of the lowest college matriculation rates in the country at 38%. So what's happening to all the folks who graduated from high school and aren't going on to college? Well, first, college might not be for everyone. There's incredible life to be had, uh, even if one hasn't gone to college. Um, there are different pathways that we need to create. Um, pathways to college, pathways to careers. And there's a couple of different models that BYCC has developed over the last few years that I think may be of interest to this committee. Um, we, we started with an understanding that the BYCC experience, that a lot of learning can come out of that. Um, so we have crews that work uh, often in really remote locations. So if you're an 18 year old uh, and you've spent 14 weeks on a camping crew, you're working with people who are different than you, you have to complete a project that requires a lot of hard work um, and you learn technical skills, it's intense, it's immersive. When you come out of that experience, you've learned an enormous amount. So there's kind of an inherent um, teaching opportunity, learning opportunity. We looked at that and we said, there's probably more that we can do. If we, if we took a real deliberate uh, look at our curriculum, our, our program designs, are the ways that we can codify that learning so that other accredited learning institutions can uh, offer credit to our participants who've been, uh, who've been enrolled in our programs. Um, and two models, one is um, we now partner with CCV, the New England Board of Higher Education really wanted to develop alternative pathways into higher education. And they helped us look at our, the BYCC experience and the training that we provide crew leaders. And last summer we piloted this where if you're a crew leader at BYCC and you work with us for a summer, you'll earn 12 credits at CCB. Then 35 of 38 of our crew leaders completed all the paperwork to um, receive those credits. So it's an example of innovation in the higher ed space that BYCC is part of. Um, in fact, there's a great article about uh, one of our crew leaders who moved from Kentucky, got credit, and is now at Northern Vermont University. There's another model that I'll share, which is uh, where we, along with Audubon, are working um, with UVM. There's a course called Ecological Restoration, 
And as part of that course, the students in that, enrolled in that course have to work for a conservation organization in order to get credit for the course. So BYCC is one of those conservation organizations, Audubon's another, the Land Trust, I think um, there's, a, there's a couple more. And in many ways, that's both helpful to the students in UVM, but also helpful for us because in fact, they're doing the recruiting um, because they've already enrolled the students. So Mr. Nob, I'm gonna interrupt you. I just wonder, so what would you say your elevator speech is to the Appropriations Committee and us? You guys are sort of a transition time for students. You mentioned, just tell us how students really connect with you and then is it sort of like, then you, they go to UVM or is, could it just end with all of you? I would say, Regard, uh, in every serve, learn, earn organization, yeah. we enroll Vermonters okay. um, who um, are wanting to gain more skills okay. prepared for either future learning opportunities or the workforce, and we give them an enormous amount of uh, training. And not only do we train them, but we pay them so it's accessible. And at the end, uh, Vermont has a stronger workforce because of the outcomes of our programs. And that's great. So that would be almost put you on with, you might have, you might go to CCD for a certain class, yep. might go to all of you for a class, could go to Castleton for a you know, it, it sort of just broadens that landscape of educational opportunities. Right. And your focus would be opportunities connected to Audubon, connected to, uh, things in the environment generally. Um, do you want to speak a little bit? Yeah, I think I'll quickly speak up too, because Vermont works sure. for women. We're yes. really trying to get more women in a diverse population into the workforce. We right. need more workers, and we need to reach untapped potential that's sitting across our state. And so we actually start in middle school to build curiosity and confidence. Let's get chainsaws in hand. Let's put them with welding equipment. Let's take them to the tech center so they know that. But we also know that girls and women are not finding those fields readily. They're not going into some of the fastest growing, highest wage, highest need jobs across Vermont. Tech centers still at, sit at less than 11% female enrollment. And if we look at some of our construction uh, infrastructure jobs, less than 3% are actually tools in hand or ready jobs. So our organization really tries to find those individuals that are motivated, that have those transferable skills. If you've worked on a farm in Vermont, you can easily do any of these infrastructure jobs. You just need to find that pathway. So we are really trying to fill those gaps and make sure that they're finding those opportunities, making sure that they're accessed and that they're well supported, not just to the job offer, but throughout that so that they're retained. That's helpful. And tell us the, the ask that you're asking appropriations. We're, we've requested a $2.4 million appropriation. We're really encouraged by the way in which the House has um, Let's move that out of the House and over to the Senate. Um, and uh, we're also asking that that be included in the base. Um, the last two years we've received funding. It flows through Forest Parks and Recreation. Um, that's been one-time funds. Uh, our, part of our message here today is that this program has moved from uh, test phase, proof of concept phase, to actually now we have results. Um, it's working, and this is a smart investment for Vermont as it thinks about uh, holistic workforce development strategy. So it should be um, funding that really allows us to plan and build upon for future years. How many students, roughly? Uh, this upcoming year, we expect 500. Okay, any questions? The last piece on the Please. funding that I would yeah. offer is um, it allows us to leverage other funds. Um, so this, the $2.4 million, for example, is not the only um, revenue source. In fact, it's a relatively small piece of the, the budget. We bring in federal funds, we bring in private philanthropic dollars. Um, and so having state funds really allows us to um, match federal dollars or go to the philanthropic community and say the state believes in us not the only ones making this investment. Could you join us? So what's the total cost per seat for your students per year or per term? Oh, that's hard because it's different for every organization. You know, I'll share that at, at BYCC, we're approximately a $4 million budget and we'll have 200 participants. Um, so 20,000. Yeah, and so, yeah, roughly um, the average length of uh, a service experience is 10 weeks, uh, 
and that most of those weeks is paid. And that can be dependent on organization. So resource and Vermont Works for Women are similar. Ours are seven week training cohorts. So we train cohorts of women in seven weeks, they're paid during that time, and then they're job ready to go into the field directly after that. So the cost per participant is different where it's full time there. Ours are nights and weekends, the amount of hours that we need with individuals. If I, if I could just say, David. David Muniz with Audubon Vermont. One of the things that this that the state funding has allowed us to do was we put the bulk of that funding into direct payments to our participants. So these young people, one of the things that we were finding was that really the best way to recruit young people is to give them a job um, and to give them something meaningful to do. And that's essentially what our model is. I mean, there's a lot of support structure around it, but the state funding has been central to our ability to pay them and to pay them at a competitive wage at a moment where Walmart and McDonald's are offering, you know, $17, $18 an hour jobs. Yes, Not a question, but a comment. I would just say in the absence of an organized apprenticeship program in this country, like these other countries have, I think you all fill just an incredibly important role. And as a, as a former high school educator, public school educator, I saw the work that you did. I could see it, you know, on a daily basis and um, really motivating my students and giving them a skill set that they really craved and needed. So I, I just thank you and I'm obviously really supportive of your work. Thanks. And to that vein, we are definitely for apprenticeship <coughs> programs, but we work very closely to help build a more structured apprenticeship model. It's something that Vermont could really benefit from in a lot of ways, and all the work we do just better feeds to those potential programs that could be here. It's really helpful to hear from Sarah Hewlett that she's had that connection to all of you. Um, you know, as we look at our appropriations, the things that the committee has asked us to review, we have things like school construction. Uh, Burlington High School, Community College of Vermont, Advertising for College Universities, Governor's Institute, Adult Ed Education Literacy Network, uh, and the State Universities and all of you. Those are the key things. So um, we appreciate hearing your thoughts and your ideas and the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thanks for this time. Yeah, thank well, you. One, one last sentence. Uh, I'd also offer that an investment in these programs is also, is not just an investment of people, it's an investment in infrastructure because the work that our crews are doing at BYCC, uh, you know, to work in state parks, work in outdoor recreation. So as you're thinking about that $20,000 per participant, there's outcomes there that that that's all awesome. true. Mm -hmm. I'd be remiss if I didn't put enough work to it. Thank you for to seeing the BYCC okay. crews in all of our counties. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 He's good. good. Thanks for asking. You bet. He's going to graduate this spring. Unbelievable. Exciting. Time for him to run for the legislature. Yes. 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 Okay. Thanks, everybody. So I'm working on this letter uh, for Jane. Uh, uh, Martina, I talked a little bit about it. I kind of just shared with her what I just shared with all of you where we're at. And we just need to kind of pri give some priority to it. And, uh, so. Okay. Ms. Siglowski, please. Thank you. Jess, I think it's okay to leave that open. If, if, unless it gets loud, it just kind of keeps the air going. Yeah. I know it's not that high yet, but yeah, it's it has oh, been wow. honored. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks What time is that? Four. Four. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today on H483. I'm testifying today on behalf of the Education Equity Alliance, which consists of Vermont School Boards Association, Vermont NEA, Vermont. Sorry to interrupt. Oh. I just want to let everybody also quickly know as you're going through your file, as I see people going through it, there are things following up yesterday from the library. There's a list of a bunch of different lists in there that answer some questions. So please, I apologize for that. Sure. Uh, so the Education Equity Alliance um, consists of the two organizations I mentioned, plus Vermont Superintendents Association and the Vermont Principals Association. Vermont communities, taxpayers, K through 12 students, and schools are now at a defining crossroads. In June 2022, the US Supreme Court set new rules in the Carson v. Macon decision relating to taxpayer funding of private schools. 
As noted by the Vermont AC ACLU in testimony to the House Education Committee, at a practical level, the Carson decision means that if a state chooses to subsidize private education, it generally must treat religious schools and non-religious schools the same. The ACLU explained to the House Education Committee that, quote, Carson marks a substantial shift in constitutional law and therefore how we think about our traditions, specifically how we balance First Amendment rights to freely express one's religion with protecting against government establishment of religion. As a result of this decision, the Supreme Court has put Vermont in a very difficult position as it seeks to comply with the court's ruling while still upholding Vermont's own constitutional protections, democratic values, and traditions. The Supreme Court's decision opened the door to changes in Vermont's taxpayer-backed education fund through more funding of private schools, including religious schools. At the same time, the Compelled Support Clause in Chapter 1, Article 3 of the Vermont Constitution says that no person can be compelled to support any place of worship contrary to dictates of conscience. As elected officials, you take an oath to uphold the Vermont Constitution, and so you have to figure out if there is a way forward that will comply with the Supreme Court's ruling and the Vermont Constitution. We believe the way forward requires Vermont lawmakers to reset state laws governing the use of Vermont's education fund based on the following universally shared values. <clears throat> One, it's our duty to provide an equal education opportunity to all families. Two, all education fund dollars should be subject to consistent transparency and accountability. And three, all taxpayer funded schools must treat students and staff equitably free from unlawful discrimination. Based on these shared values, the Education Equity Alliance believes H483 is a useful step forward, even as we recognize it does not fully address the challenges we face, especially passing muster with the conservative majority of the US Supreme Court. Vermont is paying private schools to provide a public education. H483 is a step toward ensuring that those schools are held to the same set of standards as Vermont public schools, and that Vermonters hard earned tax dollars are used as equitably, transparently, and with as much accountability as possible. Transparency and accountability are built into the public education system through Vermont's laws, rules, and regulations. Every weekday evening throughout Vermont, publicly elected school boards are meeting to govern our public school districts. Their agendas are posted ahead of time with specific notice about the topics that will be covered. Their meetings are open to the public. Community members have the right to attend and the opportunity to speak to the board by providing public comment. Beyond public comment, school boards engage their communities to establish the mission and vision of the district, and they use the mission to guide decision-making, including important decisions about how Vermonters tax dollars are used in the district's budget. After school boards approve budgets, the voters have the final say by voting the budget up or down. School boards are accountable to the voters. As CEOs of their districts, superintendents develop the work plan to achieve the school board's mission. They manage services, programs, and resources for the quality of learning supported by the voter approved budget. Annually, superintendents must attest to dozens of specific assurances in more than 20 specific categories related to a host of laws and regulations intended to assure fidelity in the administration and operation of Vermont's publicly funded schools. Superintendents are accountable to the school board and to the state for operating within statute and regulations. Principals serve as instructional leaders, developing school building specific practices that support the educational mission of the district. Principals are accountable to the superintendent. <laughs> and finally, public school teachers use data to inform their teaching and to make teaching responsive to individual needs based upon what is best for students. They implement high quality learning opportunities that engage students and move all students 
toward meeting ambitious goals connected to the educational mission of the district. In addition to teachers being accountable to their superintendent, all public schools employ teachers who are licensed by the state and the licensing requirements are updated regularly to ensure evolving student needs are front and center. While H483 does not make private schools receiving public tuition accountable to the voters, it does provide increased accountability to taxpayers, the state, and to the school district that is paying the tuition. Accountability measures include <coughs> one, uh, several reporting requirements, including requirements for reporting attendance, academic progress, state mandated assessments, and enrollment changes. Two, attestation requirements related to non-discrimination, compliance with Vermont's Public Accommodation Act, and compliance with the prohibition on the use of public funds to subsidize the tuition of private pay students. Additionally, H483 includes important anti-discrimination measures, including requiring private schools receiving public tuition to adopt and implement policies and procedures to comply with Vermont Public Accommodations Act and Vermont Fair Employment Practices Act. Amending, it also amends the um, Public Accommodations Act to clarify that it applies to all schools whose services are offered to the general public. And it doesn't allow private schools to use an admissions process that includes mandatory interviews, academic entrance exams, academic history, mandatory campus visits, or consideration of ability to pay for any costs or fees. We support these anti-discrimination measures as an important step in the right direction. Vermont public schools have always been required to comply with the VPAA. They are also required to follow federal civil rights statutes, including Title VI, prohibiting recipients of federal funds from discriminating on the basis of race, color, and national origin, the Equal Educational Opportunities Act, requiring states and local school districts to take appropriate action to overcome language barriers that impede equal participation by students in its instructional programs. Title IX, which prohibits recipients of federal funds from discriminating on the basis of sex. Section 504, which requires recipients of federal funds to ensure that students with disabilities have non-discriminatory access to all programming. The Americans with Disabilities Act, which requires entities that offer public accommodations to ensure that students with disabilities have non-discriminatory access to all programming. And the IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which requires public schools to provide students with disabilities a free appropriate public education and related services to meet their needs. Vermont Public Schools are focused on providing a safe, supportive learning environment for each and every student. This includes supporting gay straight alliance networks and other affinity groups for LGBTQ students. These groups often work with building administration to address individual or group concerns and needs. Vermont Public Schools regularly respond to the myriad of needs of their LGBTQ students, including taking steps to ensure students' preferred names and pronouns are used by teachers, staff, and students, that school nurses are adequately trained to respond to all students' needs, and that appropriate bathroom and locker room facilities are available. Yesterday, a young trans man and his father testified in the House Health Care Committee about the amazing support he received from his public high school throughout his high school years. You can watch that pow powerful testimony and I've linked um, it in the written testimony, the link to the YouTube um, video. There are many private schools in Vermont with a business model that depends on taxpayer funded tuition. H483 does not change that equation. Those schools can still be subsidized by the taxpayers as long as they comply with the requirements in the bill. It is appropriate to ask them for a certain level of accountability, especially when taxpayers are funding private schools at the level of 50 to $60 million per year. We already expect similar and often greater accountability from other recipients of tax dollars. Also, there are many private schools that assert that they are already meeting many of the bill's requirements. I'm attaching data to this testimony 
um, that I received from the Agency of Education showing a summary of tuition pupil counts by supervisory union. School districts tuition to four groupings, which are Vermont public schools, Vermont private schools, out of state public schools, and out of state private schools. Included in the out of state private schools are four in foreign countries that are receiving Vermont taxpayer dollars, two in Quebec, one in Japan, and one in Sweden. I won't go further into the data, but I think it's very useful to look at to understand the context of H483 and I would encourage you to take a look at it. It um, should be posted on your website. Additionally, today we are requesting that the committee schedule time to hear from Neil O'Dell, president of the VSBA. Whether your Senate district includes school districts that operate all grades, school districts that tuition some grades, school districts that tuition all grades, or a mixture of all of the above, it's important to understand Vermont's history of subsidizing private education, how it affects the education fund, how it affects school budgets statewide, and how it affects all of our tax bills. Mr. O'Dell has developed informative presentations for his local board and community exploring the history and financing of tuitioning in Vermont, and I've provided links in my written testimony. I'm sure he would be happy to summarize the pertinent information for this committee. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify on H483. As I said at the beginning, we find ourselves at a crossroads. And through a confluence of history and decisions by the US Supreme Court, we are called upon to align our state constitutional values and laws. This is no small task. However, we are fortunate to live in a state whose founders ensured the right to public education in our state constitution, while also saying no taxpayer should be compelled to support religion. Every day, public schools welcome all students to support and nurture their education and development as they grow to be healthy and productive citizens in our democracy. Taxpayers and students deserve nothing less, and we believe H483 is a modest step as we address the challenges ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kowalski. Committee uh, questions. Uh, please, Senator Hashim. Uh, quick question about Neil O'Dell and the sentence after you mentioned him. Is there, would, would we also be able to get a list or a map of the percentage of students or the number of students that go to each private school that are publicly, uh, that are tuition? Would he have that? A uh, map? I'm not sure if he would have a map, but I. Or the, just a list, a spreadsheet. Yeah, the, that's what I submitted. Um, it should be on your website. Okay. I'll yeah. Go that yes. Sorry. That's a, there's a summary, um, and then there's it's broken down into four different PDFs by those groupings of in-state, private, and out-of-state, private, and in-state and out-of-state public. So Mr. O'Dell doesn't have it. I think AOE may have it also. That could be wrong, but Mr. O'Dell doesn't have it. AOE, I think, has that info, right? Yes, I got it from AOE. You got it from AOE. Okay, great. Yes. Okay. Sir, please, please. If I could. Uh, so, what I, this whole school environment of tuition to schools uh, is kind of a new concept for me. And, uh, you know, what I see, so far, what I see is kind of a symbiotic relationship between the districts that don't have their own schools, which need some sort of school support and those schools which exist in those districts, which benefit from having those students uh, tuitioned in. Um, so my question is, if, if the schools don't accept the premise of the bill, where will the students go in the future? Did, did, did the four different organizations at least touch on that? Like what type of uh, scenario we're potentially creating if, if one or many of those schools decide not to support this initiative? I think what we've heard is that many of um, the schools say that they are doing a lot of these things already and that it is not, um, this bill is not onerous. I think it's a modest um, step. So I think we're not going to see a big change in that area. Um, we also do, you know, we have. Um, we certainly have room in public schools to accommodate more students because overall the state student population is declining. Okay, so you essentially think it's a non issue? Yes. Okay. 
their questions. Please. So, hypothetically, let's say, you know, maybe not today, but in the near term, there's a school which um, which has fewer seats available than there are students who need to be placed. And the school needs to determine how, how, uh, how to accommodate the, the subset of students. Did, did the four organizations have a recommendation on how to address how the school would evaluate the, the, uh, the attendance? I mean, if, it, if there's more students, fewer seats, without doing any kind of the admissions uh, criteria, review, or what have you, what's the solution on how they solve that problem? Something random like a lottery? Yeah, well, the, the bill itself requires that the schools uh, set a capacity limit, or they may set a capacity limit on the number of uh, publicly funded students that they're going to accept. And then it goes on to require <laughs> that the school establish a non-discriminatory selection process when the number of publicly funded students, um, applicants, right. sorry, exceeds right. any Together. capacity. That's in the bill. Yes, that's but, in the bill. But yeah. how can you be non, I guess, discriminatory when you have to base the admissions on something or it's pure luck, it's a lottery. And I'm just wondering, you know, what, what your four organizations are advocating. Is it, is it something that should just boil down to a lottery or can, should the school have any kind of you know, review of academic uh, past academic performance or, or any any other criteria our position is that it should be something like a lottery okay thank you other questions can you help me uh, one of the things that's out there is that there's in some public schools there can be an admissions process is that just completely false that there's no way a public school could ever turn away a student. We're having folks from Hanover come in next week and some other school districts. Can you just help me with that? Because that sort of could be legend in the hallway. Right, right. <laughs> uh, what House Ed heard from um, Peter Burroughs, who is the superintendent in um, Addison Central yep. School District, um, was that they uh, admit all students that are uh, coming in from uh, non-operating districts and that they've been told by their legal counsel that that's what they need to do. Do you know if there's a state lawsuit that says that, we, that that is the law of the land for Vermont, that no matter what, public schools have to take a student? If, for example, there was a student that perhaps some might say belongs in a, needs a therapeutic school, but the public school absolutely has to take that student. Do you know if that's on the, on the books? Well, I would say indirectly all, you know, Vermont's anti-discrimination laws, the Public Accommodations Act, and then all of the federal um, non-discrimination laws that um, so that's, the public schools So that's where are. it all comes from, from yes. those. So there's no way a school could ever say, we're sorry, Brian Jr. does not fit here. No, I don't think there, there is a, a way that they okay. can say that. Thank you. Yes, I you yeah, please. Yeah. Are you talking about kids within that district or kids without? I'm thinking kids within the district. Well, I moved into a district. The district. They have to take. They absolutely. No matter have. what. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. And then the other question that I had, and I mentioned this to uh, I think all of us during our fire drill, the that sort of interview process. One of the things I just want to avoid happening is if. Again, I always give Brian Jr. who doesn't exist. Uh, if I were to bring him to a school and didn't have an interview process, am I prohibited from having an interview process? I'm just trying to find the right fit for him in, in terms of like an independent school. I'm so, you're, under this bill, you certainly wouldn't be prohibited. So I can still, I can still say, hey, I'm looking for the right fit. Compass School might be the right place. The school, I can still say, the school can have that interview. I'd, I'd like to have that interview. I'd like to visit campus. I want to see how the kid, what he or she thinks of the school. That's still OK. You could certainly still go visit the campus, yes. Okay. And have an interview and show the grades. I don't know the answer. I can check with Ledge Council also. Yeah, I would check with Ledge Council okay. on that question. Because what, I'm, what I just don't want to have as an unintended consequence is 
Brian Jr. gets there, and it's a nightmare because his grades weren't looked at, they didn't realize this, he really wanted to be on the football team, but they never, they don't have one, all that kind of thing is what I'm just trying to get at. Okay, I can check with the chance. Yeah, please. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, if Brian Jr. wanted to be on the football team, you know, you, you'd want to do your research on the school. Right. Um, you know, you go to their website, give them a phone call. Um, I mean, the example that I use was when we moved to Rhode Island, you know, we, we took a tour of a few different public schools. Um, yeah. They weren't required, you know, but, you know, we talked to the principal, we walked around the school, and then we ended up, you know, I was like 12, so I don't remember exactly what happened, but, you know, we ended up going to the school that I ended up going to. Um, so, so you, you had know, a tour. Yeah, yeah. got a yeah. tour, talked yeah. to the principal, and yeah. it's, you know, it, I, I would also say there's some degree of responsibility on the parents to look at, all right, our kid wants to play football, let's make sure that the school offers football. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I just want to make sure the parents can do that. Yeah. Yesterday from Ledge Council, and we're going to get her on, it sounded like maybe this, they couldn't look at Brian's grades, or he could, you know, I just want to make sure that it's going to be a hit, that's all. That's it. Yeah, sir. I'm hesitating. Um, I, would, I guess I would just say uh, one of the um, benefits or one of the beauties of a public school is that um, if it's not a right fit, perhaps you as a citizen of that town, of that district, et cetera, could, can help to make it the right fit. That's, to me, you know, running for school board and having that school board as like a governing body um, and being able to vote uh, in that, or even run yourself, um, just gives you a certain amount of um, say and um, a certain amount of ability to act and make change. So, yeah, I agree. in terms of the governance structure, it just allows for that more readily. Anything else for Ms. Sikolowski? No, except you did want to hear from me on H one C. Yes, well, let's stay on this for one second. Okay. Just seeing if there's anything else that we talked about yesterday that was a question. Um, under the Public Accommodations Act, on page twenty, did you have any changes or edits to that? We're we're getting and I. We'll hear more from the Agency of Education, but they are saying that we might need to make a little, some changes to that. I'm not sure if you're hearing anything. Just looking at my notes, a school that does not offer services to the general public is not a, is anything, any red flags there for you? I guess that would really be my only question. We got a call from the agency. We're gonna have them in next week, but you've looked at the bill carefully. Anything that you see as a concern right no, now? No, we didn't okay. identify a red flag there. Okay, okay. Um, that's it for me. Anything else? Sarah Machine. Okay. Okay. I thought that would go a lot longer. Um, 165. Okay. And this is Universal School Meals, which we're hoping to move tomorrow. Yes, and I, my, my testimony is very short on this. Uh, and I'm testifying just for the Vermont School Boards Association on this topic. Uh, we have a resolution that passed last fall on universal meals. It's very short. It says VSBA supports universal school meals in Vermont schools. The funding should come from a source other than the education fund. Um, we do understand that the current proposal provides universal meals funded by the education fund without a dedicated revenue stream. So given that context, we urge the General Assembly to identify and implement a dedicated revenue stream for the program. As noted in the fiscal note for H-165, dated March 31, 2023, and I know you're hearing from Joint Fiscal, I think, later today, um, they said, without adjusting any non-property tax revenue streams, establishing a universal school meals program as an ongoing obligation of the education fund would require increasing property taxes to fund the program and keep the education fund balanced. Um, so the quote ends there. 
And um, I would just end by saying funding the program through increased property taxes is likely to cause significant challenges for school districts to pass budgets funding their core educational programs in the future. So we are encouraging a um, dedicated revenue stream. And that concludes my testimony on that bill. If you don't mind, I'm just going to, I do have a friend in the room that I'm gonna call on, Ms. Horton. Can you just say a word or two about what's happening at the federal level for funding possibilities in the future? Yes. Just um, so that we, we can all kind of think about this right now. Yes, uh, Anora Horton, uh, Executive Director, Hunter Three Vermont. So, um, Universal School Meals has, in the last couple of years, uh, become really a national movement. Um, and many states right now, uh, more than half of all states, are actively debating Universal School Meals or have already passed permanent Universal School Meals bills of various kinds. And um, at the federal level, um, this is happening because Congress has not acted to implement a federal universal school meals program, but those calls are, are strong and will not go away. In the short term, um, USDA has taken um, administrative action that they have the power to take without congressional action. Um, we've actually been urging them to take this administrative action for a decade. <laughs> uh, it's taken that long, but they finally have taken it. And what they have done is they have lowered the eligibility threshold to allow schools to use the community eligibility provision, which is CEP is what it is mostly known for known as and that is one way that schools can enter into universal school meals and provide universal school meals um, within the federal rules and um, have a different way of, of um, determining what their federal meal reimbursement will be and that that way of determining first of all is administratively much easier for schools and it eliminates school meal applications for families um, and it uh, tends to provide schools with a better federal reimbursement rate than any other method. So um, they have lowered the threshold, uh, they are proposing to do so, and the intention from the USDA is to implement this for next school year. And um, what, what that means is that many more schools in Vermont are going to be able to use CEP to provide universal meals. And, um, and, and it's going to increase the amount of federal reimbursement that will come to cover the cost of meals in more Vermont schools. And that will lower the costs for the state. That's in combination with a second option that Vermont has applied for and received approval from USDA to do, and that is to directly certify students for free and reduced price school meals using already existing Medicaid data that the state has. So that also means that um, we identify right now 35% of students in our schools as being eligible for free and reduced price school meals. Um, Medicaid data, it's looking like, uh, according to the Agency of Education, um, it's possible that up to 53% of students will be identified starting next year as eligible for free or reduced price school meals statewide. So that's an in incredibly significant um, change. And it is, again, going to increase the amount of federal funding that will um, come for Universal to cover the cost of school meals in Vermont and therefore decrease the amount of state funding. Now, the Joint, Joint Fiscal Office has not incorporated either of these changes into the financial calculations that, that they are presenting, and that's understandable because um, the proposed rule is moving through that process and the Medicaid uh, direct cert hasn't started yet. And so, you know, the data is 
it's a model right now, right? It's estimates from, from DIVA and from um, the Agency of Education. So understandably, but you know, if we in if you take those models and you apply them, I think what is safe to say and what the Agency of Education did say in their official report to the legislature this year is that um, we can actually expect the cost of the Universal School Meals Program to decline from its current cost, which is $27 million. It, it's projected to come in around $27 million this year um, in the next over in the next couple of years as these additional changes changes take place. So that is what I can say. I sure. do not, you know. Um, we'll get a fiscal number yeah, and you can address this one. I just want to make sure we're yeah. just kind of having this conversation a little bit. Mr. Kloski, if we if were not to find another source, would you want us to stop it? No. Okay. Can you, can you clarify what you mean? So if we cannot find another source of funding besides the education fund, would it, would you want it stopped? We certainly would be advocating in future Com years to find a source. Completely agree. And I understand it's a challenging question. I'm just trying to get us, one of the things we have really heard out there is that it's working. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure you're seeing it as well. Yes. In your members. Okay. Uh, we have, Mr. Glasgow, do you mind saying, we do have Beth, I think, zooming in. I just want to clarify the question, the, uh, get an answer. Ms. St. James, how are you? I'm okay. How are you? Good. I just want to make sure we're okay with this. Uh, on back to 43, if a parent wanted to have an interview, let's take a school where maybe there's a it's a school for students with certain disabilities, or any school. But I'm thinking in particular, a school that might accommodate students with special education needs. If they wanted to have an interview, if they wanted the child's transcript looked at, if they wanted to have a campus tour, there's nothing in the bill that would prohibit that. Um, so Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, I have two comments. One is the bill is prohibiting a school from requiring mandatory interviews, entrance exams, uh, academic entrance exams, academic history, or mandatory campus visits as part of an admissions policy. But it does not place any prohibitions on the family asking for any of those things. Thank you. But it's, okay, well, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, you're so tiny from this far away. I can't tell when you're done talking. Um, um, I, um, I think it, the bill as drafted prohibits the use of those things, um, prohibits an admissions process that uses those things. So I think even though the bill prohibits the school from asking for those things, it also prohibits the admissions process from taking into account those, like a, an interview that a student had. So if the student reaches out and says, I want to know if the school is the right fit for me, this bill doesn't prohibit that, but it would prohibit the school from using that voluntary process. Um, <clears throat> you know, if it was a, I guess a, it, I think it's just a slippery slope. So the bill as drafted does not prohibit a family from reaching out and asking to, to do those things. It prohibits the school from using an admissions process that requires those things. Um, you know, I, I think you'd have to think about what your goals are and what your intent is in this language. And I know you, you all didn't propose this language, but it is what is in front of you. So I think you would have to think about what your intent is and if this language meets your goals or your intent. Um, uh, because I, I, I can see how all of those voluntary requests would start to get around um, if the goal was to prohibit an admissions process from using these things, period. Um, I can see how the, the, the language is drafted could be a slippery slope. What makes me feel better, though, you did say yesterday, if a child is on a, what's it called, IEP, IEP then, and they're being placed there, then that matchup 
seems like it would likely happen. An IEP or a 504. 504. Not a 504, just the IEP. Well, so um, Act 173 yep. and um, this H483 incorporates the language from Act 173 that goes into effect on July 1. Um, but Act 173 just just requires the admissions of students on an IEP if they are placed there. So not a Section 504 plan. Um, you are requiring schools to comply with the Vermont Public Accommodations Act, which prohibits um, uh, uh, discrimination on the basis of a disability. Um, but the um, language that's specific to a type of of support plan is only related to an uh, IEP. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Sibowski. Thank you. Yeah. But did you have any follow-up? I, I, I just had one question. It, it, it's either for uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Sibowski or Ms. Norton. I'm not sure which one off of these uh, numbers. But I, I see students um, uh, for school meals being in, in one of three categories. Uh, my simple thinking. One, there's those that qualify for free meals. There are those that suffer from food insecurity. And there are those that can't afford their meals already and they're not either of the other two categories. Is that a, a, a good framework to start? Um, I, I would say that it's not quite that cut and dry because what we know from um, data pre-pandemic is that um, the, there are students who qualify for free meals or reduced price meals. So in Vermont, at this point, either of those categories result in a free meal. So, so, um, but who don't, who don't eat the meal. So they're, they are actually still experiencing hunger and food insecurity at school, um, even if they qualify. Um, and then there are a group of students, I think what you were saying is that um, don't qualify for free or reduced price school meals and are suffering from food insecurity. Okay. Okay. And that's about 25,000 of our students. Okay. Um, and then there are students whose families can't afford to pay for their meals and whether or not they are actually putting funding on the students in the students' meal okay. account Good. or not. That's what I thought you would say. So, yeah. My question is, um, the food insecurity uh, group, whether they're on free meals or not, is there, is there some data behind that? Is there, you know, can you offer some kind of background, some source? That would be helpful to understand, you know, how that was developed and what, you know, what uh, population that is. Um, do you mean, can I show you the numbers of students in those different categories? No, or? no food insecurity no. specifically. The, the food is so the, the, the part about not being they're not in the free school meals program already. Which I'm driven. Well, there you go. Yeah, so they, don't qualify they don't qualify for free or reduced. That missing middle is what I said. Yeah, the missing middle. Uh, I'd like to just see something to back that up data wise, you know, source or the number or something. Mm -hmm. You know, what, rather than just saying it, I think it would be helpful to kind of like see some information. In terms of, uh, yes, I, I think I can provide you with what you need. I just want to make sure I'm I'm understanding what you're asking for. So, in terms of um, how food insecurity is determined, how it's determined that they are food insecure or at risk of being food help. insecure, That's yeah. and, and yeah. just the number. Mm -hmm. So, and if you have any drill down information on. You know, counties or whatever, anything that would help. Anything would be helpful. Just it's all been verbal, and I'm not. I like yeah. verbal, but uh, I don't necessarily believe everything I hear. Yes, um, I I do have that data, and um, I I will provide it to the whole committee. Um, in and okay. with, uh, with some That'd citations and some information. Yep. I don't think you need to move quite yet. You were told, I think. Somebody said you're going to be very brief. Do you want to do it right from there? Sure. Great. Let me sum it up this way. There's nothing that I would say that would prevent you from moving the bill tomorrow. Um, the testimony that I would present was 
similar to what Ms. Siglowski presented Correct. at the outset of these deliberations. Well, Although we all know you, you just say it. When just we, when <laughs> Jeffrey, oh, yes, sorry, thank, thank you. you. I was so <laughs> eager to get through. <laughs> um, Jeff Francis from our Superintendent Association. At the outset of the, the deliberation around universal school meals, we took a position that was, if the General Assembly was inclined to move to enact that bill, that there should be a dedicated funding source. We still would like to see that, I think it's important, because it's additive in terms of what we're providing through our school systems. Um, we also uh, were uh, paying attention to um, competing demands on the education fund when you last had this deliberation. There was a utilization of the um, reserves in the education fund, the perceptions around the big costs associated with PCB remediation, and you know at least relatively equal amounts in terms of what we're going to be necessitated. Um, the General Assembly um, suspended its deliberations. Uh, we came through the pandemic. The federal government made um, universal school meals part of the its program, not ours. And now we're back in a situation where the federal government looks like it's maybe taking some action in that direction, but hasn't done that yet. So here we are in yeah. Vermont. Um, <clears throat> I, in preparing for testimony in the House, talked to some folks, and they actually made persuasive arguments to me that even in the absence of a federal um, program, that it would be useful for schools to continue to provide universal school meals, one, for the benefits that are espoused in testimony, but two, you could create um, complications in communities that have been providing universal school meals to go in reverse, as it were. Um, and when I talked to folks about it, and it was anecdotal, like a few superintendents, few people that were working in food service, they saw two possibilities. One would be communities that wanted to have universal school meals and others that did not. So it seems that based on all the work that's been done, the promise or hope for a federal program, the fact that um, there are benefits within the learning process in school communities to universality around <laughs> school meals that age 60 165 should be supported and the caveat would be because it is additive there should be a revenue source but in the absence of a revenue source um, i would respond to senator weeks's question is that you should proceed with the bill and hope that there is a way to um, reduce the cost over time through practice <laughs> and uh, federal education policy. So that's that's a summary of my thinking on it. Thank you. We just, we have during fiscal for a very short period of time. Any questions? I'm just looking around for either Ms. Siglowski or Mr. Francis at this point. Good. No, I'll have a comment at some point. But you don't, go ahead and shoot it. Well, I can wait till after we hear from Jeff. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, well, if it's on this topic, go for it. Well, it's, all I was gonna say <clears> was that, <throat> um, I do think, um, I'm going to vote yes to universal school meals, but the caveat is we, in this, in this committee over the last couple months, we've seen the incredible pressures that are placed on the Ed Fund and the incredible needs that we have in our schools, and I think we need to keep that in our minds. As we go out and interact with our constituents, as much as I am here at their behest, I also believe it is part of my job to educate them, and I think I am going to keep um, reiterating all of what we're providing out of the Ed Fund, whether it be PCB remediation, whether it be mental health services, whether it be pre, and re, uh, pre universal school meals, um, et cetera, et cetera, sports, uh, school construction. I mean, we, we are, there's a lot of pressure on that fund. And I think it's important for folks who tend to like to vilify their school budgets that we educate them about all that is in there. That's just my, I think it's a, my two cents. Just a comment to Mr. Francis's point that yeah. I don't think we should be passing any bill unless there's an agency identified to be responsible and there's a funding source. I think the, the agency is the agency. Yeah. Of, of the adequate, yeah, I appreciate it. 
Anything else? No, thank you. Anything else? Fine, thank you. Ms. Richter. Yeah. Please. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, yeah, it was flowing. It was Yeah, sometimes, right? 100%. Uh, Ms. Richter, you uh, have given us a fiscal note uh, in on this bill. I believe it's in our file for today. Yeah, so for the record, I'm Julia Richter with the Joint Fiscal Office. Just to see you all again. Um, for folks wa watching at home, the fiscal note is posted on the committee's page right. under my Thank white you. name. Um, so I think I'll just start big picture uh, the fiscal summary, and then I can address a couple of things that I've heard over the course of testimony that have been questions that have come up, or maybe some clarifications, and then we can go from there. However, would be helpful. Um, the committee seems well versed in the bill, so I won't walk through the bill summary. Um, but really big picture fiscal impact. So JFO estimates that this bill will cost 29 million from the education fund in fiscal year 2024. Um, absent any other changes in policy, this means that the base homestead yield and or the base uniform non-homestead tax rate will need to be adjusted to account for the anticipated cost of the program. I can talk in whatever level of detail would be helpful when thinking about how this would impact the education fund and property taxes, but just big picture thinking, uh, $29 million is approximately three cent increase on both the homestead and the non-homestead property tax rate. Um, so, the other part of the big picture fiscal impact, as currently drafted, the copy, the, the, the bill itself does not include an appropriation for the provision of universal school meals. As it came over from the House, the House passed budget, the big bill, H-494, included an appropriation for the 29 million in fiscal year 2024 <coughs> um, for the universal meal supplement. Um, so that's big picture, I'm happy to talk about that in more detail. I also would like to just touch on a few things that I've heard over the course of the conversation that I think would be helpful clarification. So this estimate, if you go to the appendix, which is on the third page of the fiscal note, this sort of walks through how is this, how is this estimate been determined. So JFO estimated 29 million last year. Um, and as you've heard from AOE, based on data that from the first the first month of Universal Meals in October, it was coming in around 27 million. I don't have an updated number at this point, um, but it was pretty similar to what was originally estimated for the cost of Universal Meals. And there were a number of factors cited by AOE that were suppressing participation in Universal Meals. So just having that background in our mind, when we look at the appendix and we look at, you know, what is the range, potential range that we're thinking about, for the cost of universal school meals over time. We're estimating a range of 20 to 20, 31 million. So I do want to say that the estimate of 29 million for FY24 does factor in um, the anticipated changes that we will be seeing um, with the direct certification from Medicaid. So that is factored into the estimate. The reason that the estimate is the same of 29 million as it was last year, because we're saying, okay, Fewer people or fewer children um, qualified for free and reduced price meals of October this year than have prior to the pandemic. Um, so we're anticipating that there will be an increase with the direct certification of free and reduced children. We're also estimating that there's going to be continued increased participation because we're seeing increased participation over time with the universal meals as well as um, if some of the factors that are suppressing participation get sorted out, we might see um, more children eating more meals. So we have a range for the future of 20 to 31 million, that really bottom portion of the range assumes that 53% qualified for free and reduced price meals that you've, that you've heard that's including both the direct certification as well as the proposed federal change. Um, and the October 2022 participation rates that we saw the first month of 
of universal meals. And then the 31 is saying, okay, we're gonna have the same participation rates that we saw in October 2022, or um, sorry, we're gonna have the same free and reduced price eligibility that we saw in October of 2022, and we're seeing a 5% increase in participation. So I'll pause there. I'm happy to talk to any of the, any of the um, parts of the fiscal note or the education fund that would be helpful for the committee. Yes. No, I'm good. No, just the, um, none of this takes in consideration potential future changes coming down from the federal government, correct? This does. This does. So when you're looking at the percentage of student, when you're looking at this um, in the appendix, this green and blue table that you have here, yes, you see that it's a range of 20 to 31 million. And there's a lot of factors out there that we don't know. Um, and so we can think about a range going into the future. So that 20 million, that's factoring in those proposed federal rule changes. So the those so that's proposed the likely lowest amount that we would spend. Yeah. In the years to come. And I will say um, something that's really I think really important to keep in mind when yes. interpreting this range is a it doesn't um, adjust for inflation past FY 2024. I did adjust the estimate for the estimated inflation for the coming year, but depending on what happens with inflation, of course. That, that range could vary. Um, and it's only, the upper end of the range is only including a 5% increase in participation. So just some things to, to keep in mind. When I stepped out, I apologize to recover this or it's even in the note. <clears throat> but one of the things that we've looked at <clears throat> in my morning committee in agriculture are the possible benefits to farmers. And uh, you know, we have a percentage that in there that we're trying to build in to have give predictability to people who want to farm, people, young people want to come to the state. Uh, did you look at that at all in any way? It's a great question. Um, this, this, this estimate does not touch on okay. that yeah. um, because that has been, I, the local food incentive grant has traditionally been an appropriation. Mm -hmm. um, or I, I, maybe one time, I, I'm not very familiar right. with it. So we're giving the, the school district funds, I think, to purchase local foods. Yeah. Or we're requiring a certain percentage, and our hope is eventually, you know, you might get, you know, 10%, 20%, you know, it's X number of years. I know there's a 50 by 50, 30 by 30 goal for New England, 30% of our food. I'm, I'm looking at Ms. Horton. Not, we're trying to get as yeah. more farmers in predictability. You know, if, if you want to basically grow carrots, we're hoping that you're going to grow them and have a local school buy them. Mm -hmm. So that's I, just another piece of this. I just don't want to lose sight of personally. Okay. Certainly, and I think that um, it's helpful to keep in. It's that's very helpful to keep in mind, and I also think it's helpful to keep in mind that this 29 million is encompassing the cost of paying that supplement which is the difference between the free rate and the paid rate. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sarah, you look. My question's for Ms. Horton, actually. I should have asked you this a long time ago, but I'm going to do it now. Um, so cafeterias, and we talked about sti the stigma of having that lunch that's sort of prefabbed, and then the a la carte, for example, as two different options. Is, is under this program, will that sort of prefab lunch, I, I don't know what to call it, but the one that, you know, will it, will it still require like a fruit and a veg and a milk and a, yes, it will, okay. Yes, because that is- Could the, I just get clarification on prefab, just oh, so like the already, the, like what kids are getting? You, you mean like the, the full, the federally reimbursable meal is what you are talking about, I think, okay. yeah? yeah. And so it, it's not, it's not pre-made up. No. Yeah, yeah. There's okay. still choice that's available to students, but com certain components are have to be taken by the student um, in order for that meal to be reimbursable by the feds. And so the answer is yes to your question, that those components are required. Students don't have to take every single one, mm -hmm. but they 
you know, they have to take a, a certain number of the offered components. Um, but under universal school meals, a la carte can go away and all students can be asked to take a federal really reimbursable meal. And so that, um, first of all, that makes the meals a lot healthier for all students. And second of all, it is it provides that predictability for for farmers. It, right. it has everybody kind of choosing from the same menu of food options in, in the school. Right. And the more reimbursable meals that are taken, the more federal funding. Right. Um, yes. And so that's actually advantageous. No, thank you for that. I need to go talk to the feds because, sorry, the federal government, because um, it does end up, there's a lot of waste created, as you know, because if a kid doesn't want an apple, he just, well, although I know we talked about sharing tables, but um, I and keep he takes hearing. it and tosses it. Yeah, yeah, I keep hearing more and more about how food, not only food production, but food waste is a big part of our global warming crisis. Um, and so that is an issue that's I you know, keep thinking about, but I like the share table idea, so hopefully there's a way we can educate folks. Are schools that. mandated to accomplish that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, they are. They are. And I will just say that. Um, not that that gets to the school, solution. Right, it, that, right. That's not really the yeah, solution we want. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, but, but I would just say that school meal program managers and directors have yeah. gotten very, very creative with how to address this challenge. Um, and so there are a lot of really uh, smart and creative models out there in Vermont of how to address that challenge. Um, I will say that actually a lack of enough time to eat is probably the single biggest driver of food waste in schools. That is a different topic for a different year. <laughs> That's yeah, 100% on that last point. My, yes. my, my own daughter has to deal with that. She's a slow eater. And then there's always, she's also very social. Uh, and so, but anyways. How much time does she have to eat? I can't remember off the top of my head, but not enough. Yeah. When we have exchange students come, they insist on an hour. They just will not go to their class. They will stay and eat for an hour. And what is it usually? Oh, 20. By the time you stand in line, it can be like 15. Wow. So, yeah. So, we had one uh, school that was here, they said they want to take the meal right to their classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That. So, <laughs> so right. there's some latitude mm -hmm. at the school. Just curious if the um, over the past year with the uh, universal school meals programs in Vermont, um, if, if the uh, let's call it prefab meal, but we understand it's a federally uh, mandated meal variety. Was that the case? Is that what we utilized over the past year? Yeah. yeah, okay. Thank you. Great job. Great. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. We're integrating here. Thank you. I like A pluses. Yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> MVP. Yeah. Yeah, she is the uh, most valuable player so far. That's a, that's a good one, too. Well, we haven't awarded yet, but she is getting a lot of, yeah. <laughs> You're close. Thank you. Really what close about it? No, no, no. no, we don't need, no, we don't need <laughs> visible too. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yep. Good to see you. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Uh, hey, can we just take a couple minute break? Yeah. And we'll come back.